So I'd like to start off by asking, what does reconciliation mean to you? It's a good question. What does reconciliation mean? Because it does mean many different things to, to different people. Um, and probably also means slightly different things in different contexts, you know. So if you Google the word reconciliation, you'll get lots of hits about accountancy. And then if you mean it in a political context, you probably mean something very, very different. Um, so it is a difficult it is a difficult term to, to define and a difficult term to operationalize. I suppose for me, the simplest way of thinking about it is that reconciliation is either the recreating uh, or the creating and reestablishing of relationships uh, that have been broken down in conflict. Um, so it's really what I like to think of as the, the relationship piece of the peace building pie if you want to think about it that way and so you know peace building deals with the causes and consequences of conflict um, it addresses those consequences and causes through a range of different mechanisms like institution building you know dealing with security related matters um, and reconciliation is like the relationship piece of peace building the challenge with that is that Actually, when you start to boil it down in societies which are coming out of conflict, almost every single aspect of their governance involves relationships. So I'm fond of saying that, you know, if you think of somewhere like Northern Ireland, rebuilding a road after the conflict, say there was underinvestment in an area really affected by the conflict, is is immediately going to be a task which will involve relationships because the question will be who's benefiting from the road is it this community or that community so even the most technical of tasks uh, might seem straightforward in a peace building context but there's always relationships involved um, so yeah for me it's that relationship component of of peace building um, and then a further challenge with it is that the word reconciliation sort of implies that you there was something there before so there was conciliation before and you reconciling uh, the problem we actually have in peace building context sometimes there was no relationship so even talking about it as dealing with the breaking down of relationships is problematic because sometimes there was no relationship so the term can be a bit confusing because it implies that there was something there before but but sometimes in peace building context that isn't there And why do you think that the youth should be uh, thinking about this theme uh, in this year particularly? Why is it important to the youth? It depends on how you look at it. I mean, I would say that youth are important to all aspects of life and are generally underemphasized, whether we look at, you know, the number of young people, um, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but, you know, the, young, the number of parliamentarians who are under 30, across the world is astonishingly low for the number of people there are under 30. <laughs> so it's not just in the reconciliation agenda, it's everywhere and our societies are fundamentally ageist when it comes to social control. So, you know, if you think of uh, politics, as I was giving the example, there are formal political contexts, but if we think of uh, policing and security related issues you know young people are generally at the forefront of those of policing matters but are underrepresented in the structures that determine policing so you know on one level the way I would answer why is young people important to reconciliation say well young people are important to all aspects of society and are generally excluded and underrepresented so in a way reconciliation is just another component of that um, I suppose more specifically if we think of reconciliation as the rebuilding of fractured relationships in society, then that's a long term process and it moves across generations. And we know that for a fact, whether it's Chile, where, you know, it's now the grandchildren of the disappeared are engaged in that struggle or whether it's in uh, South Africa or other colonial contexts where it's the next generations and the following generations who are dealing with those issues. And so you know, dealing with fractured relationships is an intergenerational concern. Um, and so you want to be dealing with that as early as possible rather than, than later and, and building the, what one might think of as the resilience of people to deal with that over a long period of time. 
you've done, um, you've worked on a lot of projects um, revolving around a reconciliation in South Africa, in Northern Ireland, and many other countries. Um, what would you say is the most important thing you've learned from these projects? I mean, there are lots of things. I mean, the, the first, I mean, some of them sound very basic, but they're really hard. I mean, firstly, as I said, these processes are intergenerational and long term. And, you know, a lot of projects I've engaged with over the years, they get funding for two years or three years, but they're essentially a project which needs to run for 20 years. Um, and Northern Ireland is a classic example of that, where the first funding for the European Union for the peace process came in uh, 1995, and now it's on what's called Peace 3 Plus, I think, or Peace 4, Peace 4. So it's like now the fourth or fifth tranche of money, but it's always come in like, four or five year cycles. But if someone had actually sat down in the beginning and said, let's fund, let's set up a fund that will build peace for 25 years, which is what we've done, um, you would have had a much better outcome thinking in that time frame than thinking about these like four, three, four year cycles. Um, so I think you know planning for the long term uh, is really important. And, and I don't buy this, you know, you, whenever you say that, you hear politicians say, oh, but our funding is in four years. Well, somebody decides it's in four years. Like, you know, it's not like it just comes out of some miraculous part of the planet. So, you know, we can plan for long term. I mean, if you think of the EU, you know, they're planning the 2035 transport infrastructure. So why should we not be planning our youth peace building strategy for 2035, you know? So that's my first thought is that whatever you do, it needs to be long-term um, in a similar way, although it sounds simple, it just needs to be inclusive. It has to include all different groups of people, whether it's age, whether it's ethnicity, whether it's identity, whatever the issues are, gender. Um, so, you know, to rebuild fractured relationships, if we take that as our summary idea of reconciliation, requires this uh, everybody, um, for want of a better way of putting it. And then I would say it also involves like forward looking and backward looking processes. So if you're talking about a society that's been in conflict, there's always hurt that's happened. And so there's always a backward looking element. You have to deal with truth, justice, compensation, who did what to whom, you know, multiple ways of dealing with that, but there's always a backward looking piece, but then there's also a forward looking piece. Um, you know, what is the vision for the future? How do we want the world to look? Um, I think you can't really build reconciliation or peace without this idea of a vision of where it is that you want, want to go. Um, and then, you know, finally, we, we'd always have to say that as much as reconciliation is about relationships, relationships are embedded in, in, in the social, so if there's fundamental inequalities between people, if some people have more access to resources than others, that relationship building is not going to work. You know, you can't say to somebody, let's build a relationship when we're fundamentally unequal. Um, so, you know, it has to be underpinned by, by social change, um, which again is really difficult. But if you say, what have I learned? I've learned that there are lots of peace processes where there's relationship building, but there's not enough fundamental social change to underpin that and South Africa might be uh, an example of that um, if I think of Northern Ireland it's sort of the opposite so like there's a lot of investment uh, you know like the communities have become much closer together over time yes there are economic problems but uh, there's not as much inequality as you might see in South Africa but it's a society which has really struggled with what does the vision for the future mean and how do we address the past. Um, so South Africa was maybe better at those two, but worse at the sort of underlying economic bit, whereas say Northern Ireland is maybe better at some of the underlying economic stuff, but much worse at dealing with those visionary questions of, of where are we actually going to be going. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that helps you. 